This is my photography setup I've been using for about the past year, and I absolutely love it. So I thought I'd make a little video talking about the Fujifilm X-T3, what I think about it now that the X-T4 is out, and how I think it stands up in 2020. This isn't really like a full review of the camera, but if you guys want that, let me know. Um, this is more just my thoughts on the camera and my experience with it. So without further ado, let's jump into it. Now first I want to talk about the general operation of this camera because I think that's kind of important to understand first. Um, obviously I love this camera and so kind of it's not a surprise that the general operation has been fantastic with this camera. Autofocus is very very fast and accurate. I haven't noticed a lot of like hunting or anything like that. It reminds me a lot of my Canon ADD with dual autofocus dual autofocus, dual pixel autofocus, um, and there's not, there's no hunting or anything like that. Um, in order to kind of place the little square for setting your focus point, uh, you use a little bit of a, I guess you call it a nipple, um, uh, a joystick, that's a better word, a joystick for kind of positioning it. And I've gotten really fast with that thing, and so I haven't really noticed any kind of issues with that. Uh, but yeah, autofocus is fantastic. So when I first got the camera, I was a little bit worried or maybe apprehensive is a better word about those top dials because they're very different than anything I've had before. You know, the Canon ADD that I had pretty much prior to this. I did have the A7 III for like two weeks, but yeah, the Canon ADD, you know, didn't really have that. You know, an ISO was a button and then you spin or it was shutter was just a spin and then the, the aperture was on the, on the back. Um, here, you know, the controls are those two big dials. You have those two front and back dials that you can customize, which I have to shutter and then ISO in the back, uh, and then aperture is obviously on the lens. And so, you know, it was a very different experience than what I was used to, but, you know, in just one or two weeks, I was really, really comfortable with the fact that, you know, it's ISO on the left, shutter on the right, and just very fast and got used to it very, very quickly. So no real big deal about that if you're kind of worried about, you know, operational speeds, especially when you're on like a big shoot that's, you know, very time sensitive, something like a wedding or something like that. Not really a big deal at all. And plus you can use those front and back dials. Now another thing that I really enjoy about kind of the operation of this camera is the fact that it has dual SD card slots. So every photo you take, you can get two of them. And for me, I really like having JPEG and RAW or RAW and JPEG because then it allows me to have an option that can quickly just like throw up on Instagram or whatever and not really worry about editing or anything like that because, you know, in order to edit a RAW file, you have to import it into Lightroom or Capture One or whatever and then do your adjustments and export and it's just, just a longer process. And so being able to have a JPEG option is really nice, especially if I'm going to just import it onto my phone or import it into my computer and just upload to Twitter or whatever. It's nice to have a JPEG option alongside the RAW option as well. Another nice thing about shooting two SD cards and shooting JPEG and RAW is that one can be JPEG, the other can be RAW, and so your big SD card can be the RAW one, the other one can be the JPEG, so that when you go to import onto your computer, you know exactly which one you have. Um, the downside of having just one SD card is the fact that your JPEG and RAW will be in the exact same folder typically and right next to each other so it looks like duplicates and then you accidentally grab the RAW file, you accidentally grab the JPEG depending on which one you want, you have to pay attention to the extensions. It's just a nightmare and so having these separated is really really nice. So possibly the most exciting part of shooting with the X-T3 and Fujifilm in general is their color science. In my opinion, Fujifilm's color science is honestly the best out there. I don't really, um, you know, I'm not talking about cinema cameras or anything like that. I'm talking about, you know, prosumer slash pro uh, photography cameras that sometimes are kind of hybrids like the X-T3. Uh, for me personally, I think Fujifilm is the best with regards to color science. For me, being able to shoot classic chrome, Provia, Astia, those are pretty much the ones I use, um, baked into the camera and into the RAWs is really, really nice. What's awesome is to be able to import these RAWs into Capture One or Lightroom and then just select the look that you're going for. And what's awesome about Fujifilm is that you don't really have to play around with the images all too much. Maybe you're adjusting shadows or blacks or adjusting the exposure or whatever, but you don't really have to do much more than that unless you want to. In fact, a lot of Fujifilm photographers that I know don't really feel like they have to touch their images all too much because Fujifilm just gets it right out of the box. Now you might be, you know, kind of wondering, are you really a photographer if you're not editing your photos? But like, if your camera's always getting colors wrong, then like, that's just annoying. For me, I can just shoot a photo and not have to worry about fixing skin tones or adjusting HSL because, you know, the camera messed something up. I can just capture a photo, adjust a few very minor, you know, exposure settings, and then just crop and export. And for me, that really just works. Now the way I use the X-T3 the most is what I'd like to call cinematic photography, which even I am kind of eye rolling at the fact that I use the word cinematic because that word is just so overused here on YouTube. But uh, for me, 
that means photographing in such a way that it feels like it's a still from a movie. And yes, that involves cropping and landscape where it's like, you know, 69, 21, maybe even 239 one, which is what I end up doing a lot. Um, but it also involves looking for light that feels, you know, very uh, controlled and measured or, you know, looking for framing that feels balanced or maybe even imbalanced depending on the look I'm going for. Um, but it just involves just kind of looking for everyday moments that feel like movies and so I'll you know be walking around I end up carrying this camera around me all the time because it's just so light and so small um, you know previously I had a Canon 80D or a 7 III I had for like two weeks so that doesn't really count but this camera is just so small I'm able to carry it with me pretty much anywhere and so it allows me to just go and photograph moments that I pretty much otherwise wouldn't photograph and combined with Fujifilm's color science and especially classic chrome it just makes photographing in this way just a fun thing to do so yes, there's a lot of things that are positive with this camera. I also wanted to talk a little bit about what I you know, don't think is perfect with this camera because obviously no camera is perfect. For me, it suits my workflow just perfectly so I don't really worry about these issues, but they might be issues for you. The biggest thing I think is their crappy app that they make, or maybe the way you look at it, they don't make because uh, it's just bad. It's, it's slow, it's unresponsive, it often doesn't connect. Ugh, it's just not good, um, but personally, I don't really use the app all too much and so it's not that big of a deal for me but if you end up using it especially because it doesn't have the flip out screen if you want to use it for monitoring it's slow and it's often like maybe two seconds behind maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration but it's like two seconds behind so you you move one way and you're trying to frame yourself but you're not quite there yet so you move the other way and you overcompensate so it's just not that great so obviously this is something that you know future film could fix without even having to buy a new camera they just update the app but they haven't in a while, and so I'm just not expecting them to change it, but they might. But yeah, that is one thing that I don't really like about this camera. Now, I mentioned this just a second ago, but the flip out screen isn't really a flip out screen. It, it's more of a flip down and over and out and up, and it just doesn't work all too well. And especially if you're trying to shoot a YouTube video like this, you can't actually monitor yourself, and so you end up having to connect a monitor to the camera and then wire it with the micro or mini HDMI, I don't know which one it is. And so it's just not ideal, especially for YouTube like this, unless you buy some third party accessories. And so, you know, that's obviously a downside for me personally. I don't use it for YouTube all too much just because I have the Pocket 4K. Um, but if you are trying to use this as like a photo video hybrid, or you're trying to shoot in awkward angles that you need to be able to monitor without having it up to your face, this might be an issue for you. And finally, the last little issue I have is the record limits, especially if you're shooting YouTube like this. It's 30 minutes for a 4K24 clip, or I think it's 20 minutes for a 4K60 clip, um, and then 1080, 120, I don't know what the limits are there, but I think it's also pretty limiting. Uh, but you know, if you're trying to shoot a lot of video with this, it can become quite annoying to always have to start over the clips. And if you're shooting like weddings, we have to record for a long time, that's gonna be a big issue for you so uh, if you're doing that maybe the xt 3 isn't the best idea but for me personally I don't really run into those issues because I'm shooting YouTube right now on the Pocket 4k I do video on this photo on that and so it's not that big of a deal for me but it might be for you so I wanted to kind of point those out just in case you know you're considering that but those might be a bit of an issue for you so obviously in 2020 the xt 4 has just kind of come out and yes it's an upgrade but for me I was never really tempted by it the X-T4 came out with a flippy screen, one more color profile and stabilization, but for my filmmaking, A, I only use this camera really for photo. I do it for video for some things, but often it's really on a tripod and pans and stuff like that, so I don't really end up needing stabilization. Plus, I don't really like the look of the X-T4 stabilization. The extra color profile is nice, but it's not really something I felt like spending $2,000 on. And then the flippy screen, again, I told you I don't really end up using this flip out screen all too much. And so I didn't really feel like that was a reason to drop $2,000 or almost $2,000 on another camera. So yes, while there are better options in 2020, I think the X-T3 still is an amazing camera. And if you're looking to pick it up, I highly recommend it. Plus, now that it is no longer the newest Fujifilm camera, um, you can get it for a little bit of a discount, and so I think it's a fantastic time to buy the X-T3, even in 2020. If you do decide to buy the X-T3, definitely check out the links in the description. I've linked not only the camera as well as a few accessories, and using those links does help out the channel, so greatly appreciate it if you do check those out. Well, that's it. Thanks so much for watching. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up button. If you like cinematic filmmaking and photography videos, hit that subscribe button and pop that bell. Thanks, and I'll see you all later.